Welcome, welcome back to the, the second panel. Uh, my name is Robert Hecht. I work at the Results for Development Institute here in Washington, and I have the privilege of uh, moderating this, uh, what I think is going to be a fascinating session on country experience. Um, picking up on the theme of today's event, all of you were very smart to have joined us and come to this event. That shows already smart choices. And uh, I think that uh, CSIS made a smart choice of the panelists. And I'm going to introduce the three of them right now so we can move expeditiously uh, through their initial remarks. First of all, on my far left, uh, Dr. Yot uh, Terawatanan is the uh, founding leader of the Health Intervention and Technology Assessment Program, HITAP. Uh, which is a research institute under the Thai Ministry of Health. And uh, I've known Yacht for a number of years. He and his institute um, are really, I think, the global leaders among the developing countries, the middle-income countries, definitely are a leader in the Asia region in this area. So it's fantastic to have you here today, uh, Yacht. Uh, he's, uh, he's a medical doctor by training. He's worked uh, in northern Thailand, and he also uh, has uh, advanced training in health policy and economics. So he's the perfect guy to get us uh, started today. Uh, secondly, and immediately to my left, uh, uh, Dr. Sebastian Garcia Saiso is here with us uh, from Mexico. Uh, Sebastian is, uh, has had a number of different jobs in Mexico. You wouldn't believe it, seeing how young he is. But he has done a number of different things in Mexico. He's currently, uh, he's currently in charge of the directorate the, for quality of health care and education in the uh, Federal Ministry of Health. Uh, so it's fantastic to have him here uh, because, as I think we've already started to hear this morning, it's one thing to say we've got it all covered, we have universal coverage. It's another thing to really deliver the services, deliver them at a high quality uh, level, and achieve the health improvements that we all want to see. Uh, so keeping in mind the possible difference between saying we've got it all covered and we're really getting the job done, uh, Sebastian is, is, uh, is our person for that. And finally, in the middle, uh, Yang Zhang Huang uh, is with us today. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations uh, in New York and in Washington, and he directs the, uh, the Council's uh, program and roundtable on global health and global health governance. Uh, he, among his many uh, talents, he's also quite an expert on China's uh, health reform. And so I think uh, this morning we're going to gain some very important perspectives from him on what China's doing, perhaps on the plus side, and some of the challenges they face. And of course, Sebastian uh, will talk about uh, the experience in Mexico. So we have three, three fantastic country experiences. Uh, before I hand over to, to the speakers, I just want to say to try to sort of set the scene. Um, it's really fantastic that in Jeanette's uh, comments this morning, she talked about Chile, and we heard about uh, Japan, we heard about the UK. So already, I think there's a message here. Even, even in the more uh, cross-cutting sessions, the country is really where the action is. This is where the choices that we're concerned about on UHC are being made. Uh, and I think it's also, at least for me, worth reflecting on the question First of all, who are the choosers? What are we talking about when we talk about making choices? Who's making these choices? And what is it about UHC and some of the countries here that make the choices especially pertinent today? I'm not going to launch into a long talk on this, but I just think it's interesting that among the different stakeholders, there are lots of people and groups making choices here. We have the, the providers, the clinicians. They have a lot of views about choices. We have patients and patient groups. We have civil society organizations. Um, and, and then, of course, we have the public sector, and we have the academics, and so on. And they all contribute in different ways in different countries to making uh, these choices. For me, what's distinct about universal health coverage in the countries where it's really happening, and if you can separate the, the rhetoric from the fact, I think it's important because UHC is much hyped uh, for good reason, um, but the reality at the country level is not always what it might appear to be at first glance. But what makes UHC possible, in my opinion, is first of all that countries 
have reached a point of economic development where there is enough wealth to actually achieve high levels of coverage with a broad range of services for everyone in the population, the equity approach, the truly universal uh, approach. And also, and I think these three country examples are gonna bring it out, I hope you'll stress this in your remarks, in countries like Thailand and China and Mexico, that money is flowing through a small number of large payers. And in the end, in some ways, when we talk about benefits packages and what's included and what's excluded, we're talking about Whatever the process is within the country, the choices that are being made by those big payers about what gets covered and what doesn't. And I think that's what gives the urgency and the power to this whole discussion about benefit packages and, and uh, smart choices within UHC. So I just wanted to highlight that. I think these three speakers will bring it out well. Uh, that's enough for me. Without further ado, let me start with Yacht, and I think we'll hear from all the panelists uh, about their experience in the country that they know best, Thailand, China, Mexico, about what their country is actually doing to advance UHC through these smart choices. So over to you, Yacht. Thank you, Robert. So I'm going to chair you an explain in Thailand uh, where, where we introduced the universal health care coverage for already 12 years. So I would say in the past, uh, we were facing a lot of problems and difficulties uh, from using implicit and uh, silo-based decision makings. So priority setting in the past was set by in, in the closed door by only techni technicians uh, and politicians. But, but after five years of introduce, introducing universal health care wallets, we found a new way of doing our choice. So uh, that is my main message of my talk today is about, first is smart choice about what to be covered for whom and by how in universal health care quality. Uh, based on Thai experience, we thought it should be made by well-informed stakeholders. And stakeholder, this one is not only decision makers and payers and politicians, but also professional, patient representative, civil society, and also industry as well. And the second one is about local capacity to generating and, in, uh, and using informed choices uh, that can make the universal health care coverage sustainable. Without this, it will be really difficult. Uh, we, we already heard from the first panel on this. So I give you a really quick idea how we do that in Thailand. Actually, this is the, the, the process we set for and uh, using for the past uh, five years that we now starting our benefit package development by allowing seven group of stakeholders consisted of decision makers, academic health professionals, civil societies, patient representatives, the public representative, and industry to nominate or to inform the government what should be the new intervention for the universal health care coverage. And after that, we have a small group of stakeholder representatives to set priorities because uh, we use uh, explicit criteria, magnitude and severity of problems, effectiveness of that intervention, variation in practice, financial impact to household if we not included, and equity and ethical consideration. And after that, is, is the, after priority set, we have a technocrat uh, or, or uh, academics uh, groups, uh, including HITAP and, and IHPP, to do the assessment and the assessment was done with uh, a participation of stakeholders. And we informed uh, back to the stakeholders about the, the value for money, potential budget implication, and social and ethical implication of including that intervention in the package. And then we informed the government. Uh, the government is, in this case, is about the National Health Security Office Board. I would say that the National Health Security Office Board in Thailand consisted of so uh, a wide range of stakeholders, so not only politicians and technocrats sitting in the board, but also patient representatives, civil society representatives, but not private sectors. <coughs> and this is uh, the selected uh, example of the choice being made or being denied uh, by the government. You can see that uh, value for money and budget impact can make a huge uh, impact on the, on the decision made by the government. Uh, you can see most of cooperative intervention with low budget impact will be included in the package. But for those with low uh, cost effectiveness uh, ratio, which means good value for money, 
but really high budget implication. For example, we talking about a few years ago about whether we include adult diapers for uh, patients with urinary, urinary or fecal incontinence. In, and when we found that it's, the budget is, is quite high, so at the end, uh, the, the government decided, the, the board decided to exclude it. But when we're talking about renal dialysis, even the, the value for money is not good and is really high budget impact, but the government um, and, and the, the board uh, decided to include because there is a life-saving intervention and a lot of people are banged up, uh, households are banged up or put in poverty because of this uh, intervention. And we thought universal health care coverage aimed for financial protection. So this is the one <coughs> that should be included. And then they in include. So the last slide, I'm just showing that uh, we use, we're using evidence, uh, health technology assessment evidence, not only to say yes or to say no to intervention, but also to open dialogue for the government to discuss with private sectors. Uh, you can see many cases that we found originally that the, the value for money of intervention not good because at the time the price so high for the Thai context. And we negotiate price with industry and, and we are getting uh, support from industry to reduce the price significantly. And you see that we can save a lot of money. So uh, I heard from the first uh, panel, we discussed whether is, uh, uh, the, the HTA is, is too luxurious or too expensive for low and middle income countries. But I would say looking at the, the efficiency gain, so it's, it's, it seems to me that HTA is, is also itself a very good value for money. So I think I, I, I will end up with this one and welcome for uh, following question. Great, thank you very much, uh, Yacht. That was fantastic. And uh, people had asked in the first session about uh, the processes that countries follow for making decisions. I think Yacht's second slide, uh, which we can return to later, brought that out very clearly. Uh, and then he applied the, at least the, the part of the process that involves his own institute and the IHPP to using cost effectiveness and uh, affordability budget impact in order to make recommendations to, the, to this larger process. So that's fantastic. And also uh, the way in which armed with this information, it sounds like Thailand is able to come to the negotiating table with the manufacturers of some of these technologies uh, with a better sense of uh, how to negotiate uh, uh, prices that make sense for Thailand. So that's terrific. Um, Sebastian, over to you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank this opportunity to be with you this morning. Thank you to CSIS for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be in this forum this morning. I'm going to present you um, a little bit of what's happening in Mexico right now and what are the main questions and what are the main issues that we want to address in the near future and how we're actually doing this. And um, this morning I was told um, because of a conversation we had last night, if, if, if this meant what I, were, what I was saying, meant that it, didn't, it wasn't a success, universal coverage in Mexico. And what I want to say, and the emphasis of this is, it's a great success. It works, it has proven it works, but now we need to move to a more sophisticated level of discussion, which, as Rob was saying before, how we transform this financial coverage into effective access, how we actually make this move into having available resources and priority setting into actually making a difference in people's health. And that's basically where we are, and, and, and these are the points I'm gonna be covering really quickly because I've been told I, I only have five minutes for a half an hour talk. So this is basically how we've changed and how much we've grown in terms of what we're spending in healthcare in Mexico. And this is international data comparing different countries and where where we stand now with a, a more than 4% change in this growth over the last few years, which put us among the countries with the largest growth without decreasing. Some countries grew a bit more in the first period, but then after 2008, 2009, decreased a lot in what they're spending in healthcare. So we've maintained this growth, and we're very proud of this. And this is basically how much we've grown, and this is the public expenditure, the budget available for healthcare from 2001 to 2013, in which you can see that it has more than tripled. We have grown, and especially this component, the blue one at the bottom, 
which is the amount of money based on general taxation available for general services provided by the Ministry of Health, and how this from 2003 to 2004 with the launch of Seguro Popular uh, this as the initiative to um, um, cover people without access to social security, how it has increased more than five times, and now we have this billion pesos, so if you want to transform, it's uh, an average of 13 pesos per dollar, now 15.8. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is how we've grown in terms of money available. And if you remember the box that Jeanette was talking about, so this is how much money there is, for what? So this is the amount of people that got coverage by Seguro Popular for the last years. So we talked in 2000 that apparent, uh, 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 about 50% uh, of our country's population didn't have access to, to social security. Well, now they do through Seguro Popular. And the main difference in between social security and Seguro Popular is having an explicit benefit package in which we know what we are offering, to whom, and how much this costs so we can prioritize and we can actually have more funds available for these priorities that we set as a society. So this is um, 57.3, am I right? It's a bit too far for me, I shouldn't have bought my glasses. Um, and then the next question is, and what are we doing with this money available for all these people? And this is the benefits package. And this is, I think, one of the, the, the questions for this morning, is how, how are we actually changing from <coughs> this very basic coverage that we had in 2004? Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's more of a community service, some forms of uh, public health interventions, into this very comprehensive package, very close to what we have in the implicit packages offered by Social Security, but with one main difference. It's explicit, so people know what they're getting. And this is very important. And so we have um, now more than 280 interventions for CAUSAS, which is the basic pack package paid by capitation, decided by a commission what it should be included, and that has these very specific protocols and clinical guidelines to offer. So one of the main reasons we have this is that we can monitor quality as well. We, we, can, we can see how things are being done. Uh, we have uh, almost 60 interventions in this catastrophic expenditure fund, which pays for the most expensive interventions available in the provision of services, and we have 131 interventions for all children under 18 years of age, which covers pretty much everything a child could use in terms of healthcare. So, as you can see, I've, I put the, the little um, box at the bottom on the right, We've made huge progress in terms of who's covered, what they're covered for, and the amount that we cover from all interventions. But we have still huge challenges. How we change this into an impact, an impact that we can measure, an impact that we can use as feedback for this priority setting so we can ask for more funds into healthcare. So it's not just a matter of, of arguing we need more money because, as someone was saying before, this could become a bottom, bottomless pit. It's having smart choices into where am I going to put this money because it's creating the best results available and possible. And this needs to come from a very strong uh, knowledge of what's happening in the provision side. So this is also an international comparison on how we're doing in terms of equity as well. So how much money, uh, if you go to the, uh, I have it, sorry. So how much money we're actually spending in between this, this complementary or coexistence system? So this is Social Security versus Seguro Popular. And as you can see, we've almost reached this one-to-one -one relationship. So we're spending as much money into what we're offering Social Security covered population to Seguro Popular uh, population. So it's not now a matter of money and where the money is put and who is benefiting from what. It's what we do with this available resources. And this is what we think the next step of this discussion is, setting aside the big success that we've had with universal coverage and that we've now reached almost 100% of the Mexican population through our coexisting um, financial and provision systems. And this is a graph. Um, on the left, you see this growth of, of who is covered and how it's been a really rapid 
increase in the amount of people and available resources, and, and this shows how we've reached almost 100% of the population. But on the right, you have a very crude reality, which is survival rates, 30 month survival rate for um, kids diagnosed with acute leukemia, lymphoblastic leukemia. So you see where, um, even though you have the available resources and you have with this money, what we do basically is we pay for technology. So we have the latest technology available for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and we have the facilities and the human resources to do so because we're paying for it. What's happening with this? Well, you have hospitals, and each one of these points in this uh, snail-shaped um, graph is a unit, a hospital. So you have hospitals that ha are reaching international standards, basically what you do with that money and available resources in more developed countries. But you also have a coexisting reality, which is survival rates below 20%, which costs exactly the same. We're not paying more or less to treat one another. So it becomes a point of we still have an equity issue because depending on where you have access to treatment, your result. And that's I believe is the next frontier and what we want to focus on. If we're paying for universal coverage as a society, then we need to guarantee similar results regardless of where we are accessing this treatment. We need you to okay. get through in the next minute or two. We'll come back to some okay. of these issues. So, so basically this is what we did. We are analyzed each of these units, accredited unit. We have a quality system going on. Um, and this is a result. This is for general interventions in um, uh, uh, pediatric and adolescent cancer. And we found that some of this has to do with the provision side. So we're competing for resources and we're competing for demand in some of these units. So what we want to do is basically transform this into a more homogeneous plan on how we provide services with this universality or availability of resources. And this is basically the general map in which we say that we need to move and we need to analyze this system, what sort of health risk are we covering? And we've made huge progress with community risks, which we've made amazing progress with financial risk, but we still have to make progress with what we call iatrogenic yatro risk, which is how the patient interacts with the system and what, what risk results from this interaction and, and, and health services consumption, basically. And this is where we're moving for, where, where you see the question marks and what we want to do to actually feedback this priority setting process. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sebastian. We'll come back to this. So keep that in mind. Mexico, a lot more money going into the system, but uneven results across uh, different provider units. A lot of uh, variation and inconsistency. So how to bring all of those units up to the best performing levels is a Big challenge. Uh, Yang Zhong, you have an easy task. China's a simple country. Yes, tell, it's tell very us. simple. <laughs> the, well, if you, um, well, thank you, Robert. Uh, the, um, if we examine the health system in China, healthcare reform, we know that it was launched in 2009, and now it's more than five years, right? Uh, and many of us know that this has made, made significant progress. If you look at you know, state commitment, state investment, right? Uh, the percentage of government funding uh, in terms of total health spending increased to 30%, and out-of-pocket payment as a percentage of total health spending decreased uh, to um, 36%, you know, and the health insurance coverage increased from 30% uh, in 2003 uh, to 95% today. Uh, and if you look at the, the utilization of the healthcare services, but obviously the uh, uh, the healthcare reform also uh, released this demand. You know, if you look at the hospitalization rate, increased from 69% in 2008 uh, to uh, almost 88, 89% in 2011. You know, so, so this is all good. You know, and with all the money, right, the government spent hundreds of billions of dollars on healthcare reform. You would expect you know, to see sort of like a, what. A, Economists call it a Pareto improvement, but that is not seems to be the case. You know, if, uh, the the survey data also suggests that the people, you know, including the healthcare providers, uh, the patients, they are not happy. You know, everybody seems to be complaining. Uh, the uh, one year ago when I was here, right, in that same uh, the, this USC conference, I, I met that. Um, 
uh, comment that the Chinese healthcare reform failed to fundamentally address issues of affordability and access. By that time, probably not many of the, uh, the, the government uh, officials uh, would agree with me. But nowadays, this, this National People's Congress uh, uh, the, uh, meeting, uh, the, it's obviously the consensus right, that this reform indeed uh, failed to address you know, these uh, objectives in terms of the uh, access and affordability. Uh, and so that sustained the problems of fairness, accessibility, and afford affordability hindered the achievement of universal health coverage uh, in China. And nothing is that more clear if you look at uh, the, this defining and prioritizing of the, uh, the benefit package. Uh, the, uh, we know that in China, well, we say this China is simple, but actually, if you look at the, the healthcare, the insurance schemes, that is very fragmented, where they have at least three, maybe four, right, health insurance schemes, right, government insurance schemes, right, the urban employee uh, insurance schemes, urban residence employee <laughs> systems, and the, the uh, rural-based um, insurance schemes, right, the, uh, and it is not universal as well, but it's very localized, in fact, uh, uh, that there are variations in terms of contribution to the different schemes, by the provincial contributions to the urban residence uh, insurance schemes and the country, county uh, uh, contributions to the uh, rural insurance schemes also vary. And that, uh, uh, in fact, if you talk about insurance schemes, we're not talking about just the three or four schemes, right? Because if you look at the, the contributions, right, the pools, we're talking about several thousand pools right, in the country. Uh, so that difference is in contributions also associated with this large differences in benefit packages, including reimbursement levels, you know, access to health care. Um, and uh, the um, Chinese government like to call their health insurance schemes uh, the basic insurance schemes. But uh, again, well, the, the insurance schemes are not that basic. And in fact, uh, we saw uh, a prioritizing uh, on um, covering inpatient services and catastrophic illness uh, in all the insurance schemes, especially uh, after um, 2013, the insurance coverage uh, moving uh, toward catastrophic illness. Um, they have selected 20 diseases to be covered. Well, these 20 diseases including uh, uh, some cancers, some rare diseases like um, congenital heart diseases, uh, some um, uh, the infectious diseases like HIV/AIDS, uh, the um, uh, multidrug-resistant TB, and also diabetes. Right? Uh, the um, level of inpatient services related to this disease will be covered, uh, by, I think, less than 70 percent reimbursement level, and can be as high as 90 percent. But there's two problems here. Uh, because of this emphasis on catastrophic inpatient services. Right? So many people uh, choose to see the doctors when, uh, choose not to see the doctors where, when they're sick uh, because this minor illness is not covered. Right? Uh, so when those develop into major ones, right, they will be admitted, but that is going to be more costly to treat. Uh, there is also the issue of moral hazard problems because patients, even though um, well they have minor illness, they might seek this in order to seek this high reimbursement ratio, they might choose to be hospitalized instead. You know? uh, that is also encouraged by the local hospitals because then they could obtain the insurance fund from the government. Uh, the um, uh, and also there's this problem of wide and shallow coverage, right? We know that the benefit level remains very low in China. Only uh, on average, 30% of patient services are covered. There's no coverage of dental care, uh, physical checkups are not included in insurance package. Certain drugs, including the life-saving uh, anti-cancer drugs, diagnostic means, excluded from the coverage. So despite this wide increased coverage, the out-of-pocket expenses continue to be relatively high, especially in rural areas. Uh, the, uh, we have this widespread this reports from the Time Magazine, and more recently, the Bloomberg News talking about how 
you know, patients because they are unable to afford those um, hospital bills, but right? they choose by either to not to see the doctors or when the extreme case, like this guy, the Hobei province, you know, that uh, cut his left leg, you know, because he couldn't afford the hospital bills. Uh, so um, I think um, um, the overall, there's some uh, progress being made, but uh, uh, in terms of the, the benefit level, it remains low, remains very fragmented. So I think for the government, a more robust benefit package would mean uh, to raise the ceiling for reimbursement of both inpatient and outpatient services, to remove the deductibles of insurance schemes, and reduce the copayment rate, and also that involves integrating those different insurance schemes in terms of management, benefit packages, and funding. You know, the government is making efforts to integrate all those three schemes in terms of management. Because usually, it used to be the case the Minister of Health would manage the fund for rural insurance schemes, and the Ministry of the um, Social Security and Human Resources manage the urban-based insurance schemes. But now, the Minister of um, the uh, um, the human resources and social security are taking over the management functions from the Minister of Health, but that progress is very slow uh, because of the resistance of, from the Ministry of Health. And in the meantime, we haven't seen any integration efforts in terms of funding and uh, um, the uh, benefit packages. You know, so there's a lot to be done. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's fantastic, uh, Yang Zhong, and uh, we'll come back to you uh, with your to elaborate on your recommendations for fixing all of these small problems in, in China. Um, now everybody has to wake up because we're gonna go out to you for, for, for some uh, biting questions. I'm gonna start off with a rapid fire round. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna lob these very easy questions to the three panelists. They're gonna hit it across the street and then you're gonna come in with the really hard questions. So um, my questions will be only 20 seconds long and their answers will, will be two minutes or less. So. Uh, somebody's already ready, but well, you're, you're too ready. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go first. I'm going to take my prerogative here. Um, Yod, let me start with you. Uh, HITAP and IHPP are premier institutions. You do great work around uh, cost effectiveness and affordability. Do most Thais understand and respect and accept the kinds of assessments that you make in these institutions? Because you're very specialized, you're very technocratic in a way, and sometimes you say no, the recommendation is no. So how is this seen by the Thai population? Yes, I, I think for, first I would say the, 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 the technical process alone is cannot help making smooth uh, priority setting process. But I would say we need to have trust, we need to endorse engagement by stakeholder, and that can be done with the, the process. So that's why I show you in the second slide that the process is, is a big matter as well. So uh, to, to answer your question, I would say, um, I, I would say uh, an example of the, uh, the, the word from our health minister and uh, uh, general secretary of Na National Health Security Office. I think five years ago when we decided, we using evidence, the same evidence, the same kind of evidence, and we decided to include new drugs on and detect some uh, interventions. And when they talk to the public, because every time we have a, a board meeting and we include new interventions, the media will come to talk, to ask them. So really rarely our health minister or the, the, the top level decision maker at the payers will say, we include this because it's good value for money, mm -hmm. it's because it's, it's a, uh, can is a is a cost saving intervention. We we never heard about that. But last year I, I, I quote because I'm I think that is significant achievement is that all newspapers saying that we include seven drugs and they say this is because we have evidence and clear evidence showing this is good for society. Mm -hmm. It's a cost saving intervention. We're doing this and we can save a lot of money in the future. And that is I think is it's make a lot of sense. Great. So, uh, so that is my, 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 my question. Thank, Thank my you. Yad is very famous in Thailand because he has so much power over his minister and what happens in this area. So an important guy to get to know. Um, Sebastian, um, can you say a little bit, I know it's complex, but can you say a little bit about 
what the process is in Mexico that leads to the definition of what's in these packages. I, I note that they've grown dramatically as you've uh, expanded the resource envelope, the financial envelope, and as you've uh, tried to equalize benefits across these. I know Thailand has also done an amazing job of equalizing. It also has three schemes, I think, a little bit like uh, Mexico, different schemes. Um, but how do you decide uh, what goes into those packages? Well, there is, um, from the origin, and you saw the graph in which it was a very small benefits package. That was decided by previous exercises to provide population with a general and basic coverage package. And that was based on available resources, available human resources and facilities, and what we could afford, basically. From that and, and the, the, the structure of Seguro Popular, we created also the agencies and the different bodies within the Ministry of Health to actually make decisions on this. And, and that's, how, that's what's led to this increment into the available um, interventions within the benefit packages. And uh, we have Senetec, which is a, a HTA agency uh -huh. that provides all this uh, technical information to the General Health Council. And the General Health Council groups all the institutions within the country, all the providers and the insurers, and they decide based on not just these technical um, considerations made by Senetec and some other technical agencies within, within the Ministry of Health, but also uh, decisions like the political the political uh, side of it, and, and whether this was already provided by a certain group or if there is pressure by patient groups, for example, which uh, we're trying to increase as well, as well, so that we have more civil uh, participation in all these processes. And the main technical considerations that we look at is, for example, cost effectiveness, one of the main issues, and, and we have to pass all these strict and, and, and technical text, tests for each intervention. Uh, what's the burden of the disease within the country? That's one of the main, uh, the main issues. Do we really have a problem? And do we already have a demand of services in, 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 in facilities? The total cost and what's the budget impact of including this intervention and, um, and, and, and so on. So there is a process we're working to make it this more transparent, meaning so far this is not written down. It's a process that goes through a council, so it's a, it's a group decision. It involves many institutions, but there is no written process that should be followed to include a, an intervention. And this goes as well for setting the um, catalog of technology available for that intervention. So that's what we're going towards. Great, great. Thank you very much. And uh, Yang Zhong, uh, you started talking about some recommendations at the end there that you would make uh, to the government. Um, so I guess, and, and it looks like the big issue that you feel needs to be addressed in China, uh, and, and as you say, it's very fragmented. It's almost as messy, as complicated as the United States. I mean, not quite as that extreme, but uh, it's a pretty complex system. Um, you started talking about things that could be done to make sure that this coverage wasn't just uh, superficial, that the coverage was deep, and that uh, people were covered uh, to a high level of the cost, the out-of-pocket burden uh, wasn't uh, uh, as uh, unbearable in some ways as it is in, in certain instances in, in uh, China. So can you talk a little bit more about what you would uh, advise to the national government and also talk a little bit about the extent to which the, the national uh, departments at this point are able to influence what happens at the uh, provincial and uh, local levels within China to try to drive improvements in this coverage? Well, I, I think uh, well, this is, the issue is, well, certainly it's about more money to be spent in the healthcare sector, right? I, I think uh, for a country well, that is now well, the second largest, right? the cost for to be maybe the largest, and the, uh, the government um, indeed has money right, that, uh, uh, to finance a um, Meaningful universal health coverage package, um, and uh, the the some um, the uh, health economists you know, did some analysis. They found that um, we only need an extra of uh, like 460 billion yuan, about 73 billion dollars. That's about extra of 4.6 percent of the government fiscal spending could achieve a more meaningful 
equal healthcare benefit package in China. Uh, the, uh, well, the government has you know, pledged also to increase the investment in health sector to $1.3 trillion by 2020. Uh, um, uh, and of course, there's challenges you know, in terms of population aging, you know, increasing uh, the non-communicable diseases. But I think the issue here is essentially political will, state capacity mm -hmm. to carry out all those in-depth uh, reform measures. You know, certainly the government uh, should um, have a clear understanding of the long-term, the complicated nature of the uh, reform process, if you look at Right. But, I, but, but I assume you wouldn't yeah. say that money alone will solve this problem, that China can spend its way out of these difficulties. No, it is not the case. I think uh, this is why I think it's important for, uh, in order for that commitment to be sustained, it is important for the reform to be accompanied by other measures, mm -hmm. maybe beyond the healthcare sector, in the, in the governance field, state society relations incentive, the, uh, the, bureaucratic, uh, uh, the bureaucratic incentive structures. Right? The, the, uh, Jeanette talk about essentially this is a very political process. It's about who gets a what and what cost, right? Uh, at whose expense. Uh, the, um, the, uh, for example, the efforts to push for uh, public hospital reforms now is encountering very strong resistance from public hospitals as well as uh, the health bureaucrats. You know, I, I, you would think you know, an authoritarian state has that capacity to be insulated from this pressures, right? Uh, vested interest, but the, obviously right. that is not the case. Yeah, the, the, the Chinese premier would like to say it's more difficult to touch the interest and to touch the soul. <laughs> good, good. Well, thank you very much. I think we're doing well on the time. We have half an hour. I see a lot of hands going up on this side. These people are asleep over here because there are no hands up. So let's start over here with those that are alert. Actually, the gentleman here was, was first, I believe, down. Uh, yeah. This is a question. My name is Fernando Zacarias. Oh, sorry. My name is Fernando Zacarias, Global Health International Advisors. Yod, I congratulate you for the study on the uh, assessment of technology. With aging populations and the problems of motility, problems of hearing, problems of eyesight, I saw that you, ha you had an intraocular lens. But I'm, I'm a I would like to know if you have done an evaluation of the hip, hip replacement, dentures, a hearing aid, and things that will increase the quality of life of the aging population. And if that is cost effective, what is what you have found if you have uh, evaluated that? Great, Thank that's you. a great question. Let's take one or two more. Yacht, can you hold that one on some of these other, these technologies for aging populations? Yes, please. Yes, uh, my name is Roman Macaya. I'm uh, ambassador of Costa Rica. And I was, I've been very interested in hearing about the uh, country experiences and congrats congratulate all the panelists. Um, we've been hearing about how complex it is to, to make changes in systems to uh, address new realities. You know, you have uh, legacy systems that are decades old. They were designed for a different era with different diseases, different demographics. Uh, in Costa Rica, we have a, a different layer, which is probably uh, present in other countries as well, which is the Constitution. You know, what does the Constitution say? And Dr. Vega uh, mentioned this at the beginning in her opening address. In Costa Rica, we have a, a universe, a, um, a uh, constitutional right to health. And so patients or patient groups can sue or basically go to the Supreme Court to try to get coverage uh, if they think or their doctors think that they are not having real access to health. Sometimes it involves something as sort of minute as whether they get a branded drug or a generic drug. And so you have other decision makers, which are Supreme Court judges, making technical decisions in this process. My question is, you know, given all these complexities that can vary from country to country, how are uh, countries implementing innovation within the system? 
so that you, you, you don't pretend to renew or uh, reform the entire system, which has many conflicts of interest, many uh, vested uh, interests, but you, you, you sort of unleash uh, social entrepreneurs that can use technology and different ways of, of doing things to prove a concept at a pilot stage level that can then uh, generate enough political uh, capital to expand that to the rest of the system. Great, thank you. Costa Rica is a very interesting country. The Caja Costa Ricense, Seguridad Social, is an important uh, leader in this area. Let's take uh, one more over here, this lady. I know she's been waiting patiently. My, my name is Elsa Gomez. I'm, all, I'm sorry. Elsa Gomez. I'm also with Global Health International Advisors. And my question is uh, to the members of the panel and Janet. How does uh, reproductive health care is uh, dealt with uh, within benefit packages? Uh, and that is, who is covered, uh, what benefits, and who pays for that? Mm, reproductive health care, including contraception. OK, great. Thanks. Um, let's, let's take this first round of questions. Uh, Yot, did you want to go and uh, yep. provide some quick answers? Sure. Okay, good. But I, before, before I answer the first question, I think it's, you, can, you can feel in the room that uh, people talking about aging populations, and we also the last uh, uh, lady is talking about reproductive health. So that is actually is the fact of life, and, and that is all politicians and people who are introducing universal health care coverage are facing. I mean, different group of people have different intellect, and all of them need to be, I mean, uh, part of the process to decide together what should be covered and not to, to be covered because of what. And that is, cannot be made by emotion, but I would say evidence and a deliberative <coughs> process. So, uh, Talking about aging populations, well, based on our experience, I would say there are two things. The first is the lesson learned from us is that many of uh, our work, uh, when we discuss about intervention for aging populations, we found that many of them are not good value for money or not good for society to have big investment. This is not because of uh, uh, the intervention itself, but it, what, what we found is that uh, we later we found, and we try to use a port that Janet uh, present, that we do a population-based uh, priority setting as well. So we looking at the, uh, the, the population who are elderly, and we, what we found that many of the problem should be tackled or should be managed at early life. For example, many of cancer, many of NCD, or even mental health, it's better to, to do in early life in, ter, in order to make elderly are a much healthy population. But having said that, it's not mean that the Thai government may not invest uh, heavily on uh, aging population, but we do. And you can see that renal dialysis, mostly uh, of our uh, eligible patients are is older than 60 years old, and many of the uh, curative uh, intervention also invest for, for that group of intervention, uh, of group of population. But I would say uh, the, the message is that once you do uh, priority setting in a board, the same, and you get a lot of uh, uh, options and solutions rather than only invest on in curative uh, uh, treatment for, for elderly. Thank you, Yacht. Does anybody in the panel want to take the tough question from the ambassador there about uh, what's being done to foster innovations and experiments that could eventually be scaled up? Well, well I will use the Chinese experience. But I think the Costa Rica experience is a very good one. If you look at the, you know, their, their experience of building UHC, it took uh, you know, only 20 years to build UHC compared. Well, I read that article, right, which listed the countries, the years it took to establish UHC. I found Costa Rica, the country with the shortest time period to build a UHC, well, compared to countries like Germany, right, 128 years. Right? Uh, that is certainly a time we can't wait. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, I do believe that even in um, democracy, certainly will what they have these advantages, but even in authoritarian states, which have this 
central you know, corruption all this in place. The innovation indeed could happen also in the healthcare sector, you know, that uh, provided that you have provided proper incentives. Uh, uh, well, let me give you that example, whether it's that I didn't mention in the opening remarks that you know, recently the Chinese government introduced this so-called second time reimbursement uh, uh, policy. You know, basically, uh, after the first reimbursement from the basic insurance, you know, uh, for those out-of-pocket payments less than 10,000 yuan, you would have this at least 50% of this second time reimbursement, you know, based on this you know, extra pay, out-of-pocket payment. You know. uh, for some of the special cases, they could even, they could even allow uh, the third time reimbursement. So where is the money from? They actually took the money from these, the uh, health insurance fund then buy extra insurance from the private insurance. So, uh, the, uh, so uh, and then they all, uh, recently they also started to encourage the, uh, the health philanthropy, you know, the commercial uh, insurance. So in this way, you don't need to pay. The government doesn't need to contribute extra money. Right? But this innovation itself right, significantly reduced the problem of affordability. Thank you very much. Um, Sebastian, did you want to yeah. remark on any of the three I questions? Think, I think they all go together, and it's part of having universal coverage. I mean, you have to have all these different spheres into your site and actually being able to deal with them. And the burden of disease and these latest studies by the um, IHME let us know how we are all getting older. Uh, the uh, disease pattern that we had is no longer there. So we need to see what's actually going to be the burden later and how much this is going to cost. And this is why including this other um, intervention is essential to actually keep people healthier longer. And, um, and I think that we're doing, all of us, in, in, in a certain way. Uh, Costa Rica is a great example on, on how they've, they've changed and they've moved very fast. And I would say the analogy is actually repairing a fast-moving train without having it derail. And that's what we do every day, and that's what the challenge is about. How do you actually keep on providing services to a population that will not stop demanding just because you are under repairs, and, and actually getting to a place in a stronger and better way than where you were before. So that includes a lot of uh, technical uh, elements of policy making and policy implementation, which is, I would say, the main challenge. I mean, anyone can come with brilliant ideas. The problem is actually you, uh, how you move all these different spheres, the political, the economical, the social, to actually make this work and make something happen and, and for better. And I think Costa Rica, I insist, is one of the better examples we have in, in Latin America together with Chile, and, and, and we in Mexico follow you guys very closely. I, I was just in a meeting with the, um, one of the key people at the Caja Costarricense basically talking about burden of disease and how we're actually moving towards addressing that, not only talking about interventions, but how do we address this burden of disease. And in terms of the um, interventions on reproductive health, uh, I, I'm not sure about other experiences, but in Mexico we have that cover in the very basic package from even the beginning before Seguro Popular. Uh, that's been one of our be uh, highest bets all along in which we believe that if we have a healthier country in terms of reproductive health, we will have better outcomes across the entire uh, uh, pattern of disease and demographics. So uh, we, who's co who, who pays for that? The government pays for that. It's included both in the, both in the social security packages uh, and of course, the, uh, actually the social security package as insurance is called health and maternity. So basically making very explicit this priority and, and in Seguro Popular it's covered by causes, both the uh, uh, prevention and promotion and the um, uh, delivery, delivery part of that as well. And just really, really quickly, what, what this goes to is um, once you have everything covered, then you start dealing with social determinants that are hard to actually reach from the health perspective. And that's where I think our efforts will go as well so that we manage to finance also interventions to deal with social determinants so we have also better outcomes in terms of uh, uh, reproductive health. Thank Great. you. Great, fantastic. Thanks, Sebastian. Let's take some more. Oh, good, this side of the room is woken up. Um, let's take uh, one, two, and I think Jeanette had a question too. Keep the, keep the questions yeah, brief, um, please. The comment yeah. on insurance. I just wanted to know, I mean, all three of these countries are countries with fairly large middle classes. 
um, and very large econ of good economic growth. I mean, to what extent is the private insurance company now starting to, private sector now looking at um, covering things that are not covered by the essential plan and uh, also covering the co-payments? And are the governments monitoring that? I mean, obviously that would leave more fiscal space to worry about the poor if the private sector was, um, was handling some of these things. Thank you. So you're t asking about health insurance, private insurance as a top-up on, on top of the basic package. Thank you. Not as a substitute. Um, please, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, I had a more broad question about the private sector, and I just was wondering if any of the panelists would uh, elaborate on the roles of the private health sector and the, pri the private insurance sectors and uh, their thoughts on how the relationships with these sectors could be changed to help them achieve their goals uh, in universal health coverage, um, ideally. I have another quick, quick question about Mexico, and that is that, that sort of hole in the table about quality. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate now on how quality is monitored there, what institutions are involved, and um, what your current system is. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so there are two oh, questions I'm Lisa there. Tarantino. You have to pay extra because you asked two yeah. questions. So. From Apt okay. Associates. Sorry, I didn't Thank you. Me. Please, Jeanette. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a kind of a comment and a question. I think that the issue of, 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 of uh, judicialization, I think it is, of the of the benefit is, is a very big issue. And, 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 and I think that one of the problems is that if, if, if you don't advance, I mean, first, the, co the coherence uh, uh, in, in the legal system. If, if, the, if in the Constitution is the right to health, that, from a point of view of, of the ethics and the public policy, it's a very good thing. At the same time, you can be sued. And, and basically, in Colombia, it, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, the thing is increasing kind of, and we are having the same problem. I wonder uh, if, if you have any experience uh, on, on how do you deal with it, because you don't want not to have the right to health in the Constitution. At the same time, you don't want to be basically having the judges making decisions, which is a big risk, and in fact, it's happening in, in several countries, at least in, in Latin America. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Jeanette. So we want health to be a right, but we don't necessarily want it to be a statutory constitutional right subject to uh, Supreme Court litigation. Uh, interesting. OK, and one other, maybe over here. Sure. So uh, this is a question that really gets at the issue of smart choices because, um, and you have a number of, of uh, technical folks on the uh, stage that can get at methods. So uh, when you build a mathematical model, uh, what goes into it uh, are assumptions and data. So the assumptions uh, can vary widely and the data that you uh, put into the model to power it uh, can be uh, also variable. So, uh, and you can, you can vary all these uh, 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 inputs into the model and other factors as well, and, and you all know this because you work in this field. So uh, the outcomes that you get are really dependent on uh, your data and your uh, assumptions and, and other factors as well. So when you're uh, trying to make a policy recommendation, uh, how do you uh, uh, deal with that uh, very obvious uh, problem? in terms of making a case to the government about what might be, let's say, easier outcome, cost effective, or, or what might be uh, a bad policy decision uh, under those circumstances. OK, thanks. Sorry, just to clarify, you're asking what, how do we deal with limitations to these models and uncertainty in the data? Is that your question? Yes, it is. OK. OK, yeah, let's close OK, well, let's, keep, let's keep moving. I just want to make sure we understand what you're asking. Um, let's go back to the panel. Uh, Yacht, do you want to go first with one or two of these? Okay. Uh, All great questions. <laughs> maybe I'll be with the last one first. The last uh, question is about how we do with assumptions and uncertainties when we do uh, priority settings. I think, I think we are, I can have a, a quick uh, response, I think, in two ways. The first is that we need to be frank to stakeholders. So we never say that we can decide it 
on that benefit packet with 100% of confidentiality. So we need to say what is an assumption made and what is the limitations of our data that we can extrapolate. The second one is, I think, is more important because the first one is, is something inevitable, I mean, in, in the real world, that we never before implement that intervention. So we need to make assumptions and to, to, to see what would be likely the cause and outcome. But, but the second one is that we, after the decision being made, what we need to have is have good infrastructure that try to monitor and evaluate whether it be as we predict. For example, I give you an example. Um, uh, two years ago, the Thai government made, uh, I think, it's a very significant uh, decision to include off-label use of cancer drug for eye treatment, the bevacizumab. At that time, the big assumption is that we, we already know the evidence is that there are equal efficacy between uh, off-label drugs and the registered drug for macular disease. But the price is around 40 or 50 times different. So the Thai government go for the cheaper one at the, uh, for the off-label use. But the big assumption is that we don't know about safety of that drug. But given the information at that time, it's presumed that it should be equivalent. So the government decided to support the, the, the cheaper drug with the, co the condition that we need to follow up the safety profile of patients. And now we have 60,000 people who are having off-label drug use. And we look at the, 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 the safety profile of the drug. So that is, I think, this, this type of thing needs to be in place when you have uh, universal calculator and you, you talk about benefit package. You not only talk about the upward uh, policies development, but you need to look at the, the, the downward uh, policy implementation as well. Thank you very much. Let's, let's go over to the other. I know you have more to say, but I wanna, we're, we only have about 10 minutes left, and I want to give you each a chance to make final remarks. So uh, take your choice, private well, sector, constitution, okay. whatever you like. Well, I'll be quick, actually. I'll, uh, to um, answer the question about the role of the, uh, the private uh, the insurance, uh, uh, commercial insurance, okay. actually. I know that in the case of China, they, they actually less than half of the people in the country actually using the private health insurance. That percent, the, the share is actually larger in the rural areas, uh, but uh, in the uh, urban areas, actually I think less than 30% actually the, for urban residents using the uh, private insurance. You know? So there's certainly a lot of room for the private sector to play on this process, you know, given this, you know, the, uh, that the, the government cannot uh, you know, provide all these benefits. You know, packages to the people. And uh, uh, speaking of the smart choices, I think it's very important to do evidence-based decision making, but it's, I think it's equally important, again, to have all the stakeholders to be brought in this decision making process. You know, and it's unfortunate if you look at a country like China, where you have all the health bureaucrats, politicians making the decisions, but essentially there's no input of the people, the beneficiaries of the, the, that the process. So I give you this obvious example, right? Uh, the, we know that it's very expensive the, uh, the, for the most effective drugs, right? For, to be sold in China, some of the anti-cancer drugs, you know, cost you know, one hundred dollars per day. What well, we talk about, you know, like uh, the one course, it's two months, that will be about six thousand U.S. dollars. You know, that is crazy because you know that in a country where the, the GDP per capita is still uh, just a several thousand dollars. You know, uh, but uh, you know the, the, the country has this capacity where it could import, for example, the uh, India-made generic drugs, right? Would uh, cost much less, probably about ten dollars a day. But the government won't allow that. The, the public policy won't allow that. And in fact, they recent to this guy who buy, bought the, the drugs from India and the sale that in China was arrested you know, for smuggling counterfeit drugs because anything that is not allowed by the government is considered counterfeit. Uh, so it, uh, this is a typical example you know, that in the decision making, they fail to even take into account those you know, people's desires and wants. You know? Great, well thank you. you introduced two really hot things here at the end, which is dangerous. One is around <laughs> drug prices and intellectual property, and the other one around uh, I know, we're in the participation. So I'll let you, I'll let you talk to our friends from Pharma here during the lunch. Um, yeah. 
Uh, over to you, Sebastian. Well, really quickly, I think on the uh, Mexico quality of surveillance mechanisms that we have, I think we can talk a little bit after, after we finish, so I don't take more time explaining. Mm -hmm. And um, on judicialization, I don't know if that's a correct word, but um, <laughs> I didn't mention it before because I think it's something we have been observing very carefully uh, over the past years. We also have that issue in Mexico, um, especially, well, the, the, the probably the largest issue we've had was with the social security side with which um, implicit uh, coverage means it doesn't say what it covers so it was forced to offer orphan drugs so that's that's uh, uh, one of the biggest issues they would have popularly included it right away after that without having the uh, Supreme Court deciding and um, but those are the things that come into um, into questioning when you have uh, this very technical side making decision and then you can create also pressure on the other side and then it becomes another group, the judges deciding on what the package should be, which is a, a very important question on this. Um, and just going back to smart choices, I mean, you need the information to make any choice, whether it's smart or not. And uh, if you want it to be smart, then you have as you need to have as much information as possible from not just the technical and very hard side of it, which sometimes uh, it turns out is not as hard as we thought because we had to make many assumptions and the quality of data is not uh, completely uh, 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 there. So you need to make choices anyway. Otherwise, the train moves and leaves you behind. So I think you have to have all these perspectives that we were mentioning, and data is a very important one, of course. Great, thank you. Um, I know there are more comments and questions, but we need to wrap up and then go over to our lunchtime speaker. I'm gonna finish by asking each of the panelists, I'm gonna give them a choice, of course, in the spirit of this. And you, you have one minute, and I'm gonna give you three choices. One is, any advice for US policymakers um, on how to make smart, smarter choices under not quite universal coverage in the United States. Secondly, is there anything the United States could do to help countries like your own to make smarter choices? Maybe yes, maybe no. And your third choice is whatever you'd like to say as long as you keep it to one minute. Sure. Thank you very kindly. Yeah. So I take the last one. Actually, I want to respond to uh, Janet about uh, jurisdictions. I think uh, if I think Thailand is really lucky that we don't have that uh, kind of problems. Even we have in our in constitution, we say it's right to help, but we never have um, many uh, court challenges uh, for uh, decision maker who make choice about the universal coverage. And I don't think uh, having judged to make a decision uh, on what should be covered and not to be covered in the benefit packet is not the right approach. I don't think the lawyer is better informed policy decision makers than we do. So I think that is the way that we should do is that the, the health system, I think it's in those countries need to think clearly how to I mean, take away that decision from the lawyer to be the people in the health system. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think, uh, well, I've probably also <laughs> addressed the second question. I think for the United States, when we're trying to export our experience, I think one thing that we want to tell the other countries that don't learn from us, uh, the <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, that is well, in terms of the, the healthcare spending, but indeed, well, uh, uh, this is only half right. Uh, I think the U.S. indeed could have a lot to offer in terms of the, um, the uh, healthcare, the, uh, the knowledge, the know-how, you know, and uh, uh, the management experience, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, also the uh, investment, in fact, in the country like China is now encouraging social capital to um, enter the, social, uh, the healthcare sector. These are uh, not just uh, the uh, experience and know-how, but also the investment. You know? So uh, there's indeed a lot to offer the United States could offer. Great, great, that's fantastic. Um, Sebastian, last word. I think this um, already exists and it's both ways. I think we've, we've learned uh, a lot from the U.S. And, and the U.S. is probably also looking at all these um, laboratories we have uh, on universal health coverage across the world. Uh, Mexico has a relationship which is natural. We share more than 3,000 kilometers of uh, border 
and, and our citizens move every day from one country to the other and we offer them different things and we offer di uh, different benefits from, from being part of these two very large moving societies that interact every day. So I think we can still learn a lot and, and have this very close interaction and continue to build these bridges across our huge border. Great, great. Well, thank you. Um, I think uh, we've heard uh, three fascinating and very pertinent uh, examples from three very important countries that are leaders in, uh, in uh, universal coverage. They've all moved dramatically in that direction over the last uh, decade or two, remarkable progress, and uh, all wrestling with trying to make smart choices within the resource uh, limitations that they face. So I think we've learned a tremendous amount. Uh, I hope, uh, Jimmy, that this is a good setup for your talk, and Steve, I'm trying to shift it over to U.S. policy and what it means for the U.S. and the kind of two-way exchanges that perhaps um, could benefit the U.S. and could also benefit some of the uh, other countries. So I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, the three panelists and giving them a round of applause. <laughs>